Um, Amy Schold is our presenter today, and um, she's going to be speaking on microaggressions. We are recording this session, and for it, she has a slideshow that we'll also be sending out with the recording after we close the webinar. So you will get a copy of that. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Amy, and oh. take it away. Wonderful. Um, so not only can I not see the chat or the q and I can't see any of you either. So if I'm not looking at you or if it looks like I'm looking somewhere off in space, forgive me. Um, but uh, with lovely Zoom and the way that these presentations go, the only thing I can see is my slide. Um, so bear with me on that if it seems a little impersonal. Um, so I am Amy. I am a therapist. I have been in the mental health field for about 30 years years now. Um, I have done a range of things within the mental health field. I oversaw six counties mental health centers. I've done program management, program development, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but I have, as I'm easing towards retirement, I'm going back strictly into therapy. I especially love working with personality disorders. Um, I do believe all behavior has meaning. So that really fits into micro aggression. And so we will see how that is today. Um, so to really cover microaggressions in depth, we would probably need the full six hours or so that you all met today. So I'm going to do as best I can within 30 minutes to kind of give you um, the nuts and the bolts of all of this. Um, and to be sure that you have an understanding of what microaggression is, where does it stem from? What the effects are? How can you be aware if you're doing it yourself? Um, and we all do it, so it's no no um, finger pointing here. And how so also to address if someone you feel is using microaggression against you. So that's what we're doing today. So let's start with this quote. Words are, in my not so humble opinion, our most inexhaustible source of magic, capable of both inflicting injury and revving it. So with that in mind, well, let's start out with an easy exercise, okay? So if you will either take out paper and pen, or if you all are really doing games on your phone or something while you're listening to me, if you go into the notes section, I'm gonna give you 12 words. And what I want you to do is I want you to write the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word, okay? Here we go. Dark. Wicked. Chill. Use. Plump. Patriotic. Spirit. Left. Bat. Foul. Right. Mean. All right, hopefully that didn't go too quick for you. So let's see what you came up with. Um, in the chat, if you could, what's the, some of the first things that came to your mind, if you wouldn't mind putting it in, um, and tell me what dark, when I said dark, what was the first thing that came into your mind? And I'm gonna have to assume Sorry, I was muted, quiet. I'm sorry. Night, black, <laughs> light, okay. gruesome, Ooh. scary. Okay, good. What about wicked? Witch, pure, scary. Okay. Witch, chill. evil. Okay. How about chill? Chill, mm -hmm. cold, relaxed, ex-mother-in-law, <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And OK, so let me go back for just a minute. If I would have used and had asked you the term wicked before dark, do you think it would have had an influence on what you thought dark meant? Yes or no? 
Because if I say dark, you can think like black, you can think night, which some of you did. You think more in terms of color dynamics. If I would have said wicked first and then dark, then would you have thought more something evil, something more, you know, kind of nasty? Sinister. So you've got about equal yes and no's and okay. a couple of maybes or not sure's. Okay, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead too. then. I had mentioned the word bat. When I said bat, what words came to mind? Or what images? Or what did you think? Put that in the chat, please. Baseball. Wings. Sport. Cave. Animal. Okay, good. All right. And then I said foul. What were the images or thoughts that you had when I used the word foul? Smell, perform smell, chicken, marriage. Oh. <laughs> bird, okay. I gave you that bird. That's supposed to be bird, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, yeah. Um, and foul could have been F-O-W-L or it could have been F-O-U-L, right? Either way. And so I guess the same question in terms of if I would have used the word foul first and then bat, for those of you who thought foul in terms of like a game call, then would you have automatically thought like the sports equipment bat as opposed to the animal bat? Um, or or foul, F-O-W-L, in terms of bird, then would you have thought the winged creature, mammal, bat? So words are really important, you know, not just the ones that you use, but sometimes the order that you use them too, because it can provoke images and how you say it too, right? Because if I say, oh, you're so chill, or if I'd say chill, same word, very different, meaning based on how I use it. Same with wicked. It could be like, ooh, wicked. Or I could be like, wicked. So how you use a word, how you say a word, when you put words together, it all has meaning. Words can mend broken hearts or they can fuel the flames of conflict. They have the ability to shape and reshape our perceptions. They influence our decisions and sometimes they even determine the course of our life path. So bringing all this together into microaggressions, which is what we're talking about today, why do we start with words? Um, and let me give you a clue. What is a microaggression? How about that? Anybody have any ideas? Can you put it in the chat? Do you know what microaggressions are? Am I basically preaching to the choir or is this something new? One of our um, CNAs put happy CNA week, which began today. So happy CNA week, everybody. And somebody put after that, let the fake appreciation begin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I don't think he was trying to give an example. I think he was just making a statement, but I think that qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said small amount of aggression. Someone said, I know about them. Okay. Okay, well, let me give you an example. So I'm almost 60, right? And a term, something that somebody tells me a lot is, you don't look your age. So is that a microaggression or is that a compliment? Can you put that in the chat, what you think? Microaggression or compliment? You don't look your age. Microaggression, microaggression, compliment. Compliment, compliment, ageism, compliment, compliment. Wow. Okay, good. All right, so almost 50 50. So it really it is a microaggression in the sense, and somebody put ageism, and so that nailed it, right? Because basically, what it's saying is you don't look your age, 60 is old. <laughs> now, did the person and the people who often say that mean it in that way? Or was it meant as a compliment? Did I perceive it as a compliment? Or did I perceive it as? <sighs> I think 60 is old. So how the situation is handled will be dependent upon the interpretation of the person who is hearing it. Um, and so that's something to bear in mind if you decide to address what you're hearing. And we're going to talk about that um, in depth. <clears throat> 
So microaggressions are actions, statements, and other behaviors, unintentional or intentional, that discriminate against people. They can take a lot of forms from subtle insults and invalidations of people's experiences to overt insults on somebody's identity. So some examples of this is, wow, you speak English well for being Chinese, or you're so articulate for someone from your background. Or wow, you really talk well for somebody who didn't go to college. That's being discriminatory, right? Now, do everybody who uses those terms mean it in that way? Maybe not as an insult, but it is because they're not speaking from a point of taking in the other person's perception. Right. And this will happen a lot, especially if you think in terms of somebody maybe who is depressed or anxious and you tell them, oh, just think positively, you'll be fine. Well, guess what? If you're depressed, no, um, you're just being too sensitive. It's not a big deal. But if that person's truly struggling with anxiety or PTSD, no, that's that's going to be insensitive to what's going on. And it can be so overt. You are so exotic. What are you? Or how do you get your hair to do that? You move pretty good for walking with a walker. <laughs> and it doesn't just have to be verbal, right? Somebody who's followed around a store because the clerk thinks that they're going to steal from them. Or if you've done this or if had had this done to you, you do an eye roll. And maybe some of you are doing it there to me now. I can't tell because I can't see you. Um, it's invalidating somebody. Moving faster when you see a group of younger individuals who are a different gender, a different race, placing less or no value on non-traditional or Christian holidays or traditions. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. We have a doc at our facility um, and she was a veteran. I'll call her Lauren. Um, and so we used to get off Veterans Day. We don't anymore. They gave us Juneteenth instead. And of course, you know, every day that we're closed, we lose money, right? So they're not going to give us both holidays. So Lauren being a planning and said, so what, we get off Juneteenth, but they don't want to honor veterans? Now, did she mean anything against Juneteenth? No. But, or did she? I mean, I know her and I know she didn't, but again, people who heard her could very well, especially if they're black, take it against them that, hey, what, Juneteenth's not important? You think Veterans Day is more so? So that would be an example of a microaggression. Microaggression against people with disabilities, and especially if they, most of the audience is CNAs, and especially myself too, being somebody who works with people with disabilities, if you belittle somebody's need for auxiliary aids to perform everyday tasks, that's a microaggression. Um, do you ever go to Walmart on a Saturday and think, do they really need all of these handicapped parking spots? That is a microaggression. Um, treating people with disabilities as if they're children, like talking to them in a sweeter, you know, nicer voice. That's a microaggression. I had a um, client who was volunteering working with people with disabilities, and she ended up getting asked to leave because she asked if she could pray for them um, because she was hoping that God, um, that's her higher power, would help. The, with the disability. So that was considered a microaggression. So they fall into three categories. I'm just going to mention these real briefly. There's micro assaults, micro insults, and there is also micro invalidations. So for those of you who want to go further into this, you know, you can look up those three terms um, and that's, it, it goes into specifics of how you can break these down into categories. So I'm not going to ask, I'm sure all of you have experienced microaggression in some form or another throughout your lives. I'm not going to ask how many of you engaged in any of these behaviors, but I will say it is likely because we all have biases and it is biases that drive microaggressions. The key is to know what your biases are. So some things that you need to ask yourself. What core beliefs do I hold? 
how might these beliefs limit or enable me and my colleagues at work? Now, core beliefs can be as big as religion or as something kind of specific and minute as, say, money saving and spending. And I will own up to this one. I have um, I grew up in a, ra a family that was not the richest. Um, we ate out only for very, very special occasions. And so that was how I was brought up. And that was for the most part in life, how I grew up thinking you only eat out when it's something specific. Now, times have changed, you know, all of that has changed. However, there are a lot of people I work with that I know who make a lot less money than me. And that's not a slight, it's just the reality of the field that we're in. They're constantly door dashing for lunch and then they complain about the money they make. Now, I feel a certain way about that. And when I see it, you know, I will do the kind of head shake or something. And I catch myself because that is a value that I was raised with in terms of saving money for things that are more important. Now, do I know that they don't have time to fix because they've got kids at home or a husband to get out the door or a wife to get out the door? You know, I don't, those are the things that you have to stop and think about before you say anything, but you have to be able to recognize within yourself when you feel a certain way about things. How do I react to people from different backgrounds? Do I hold stereotypes or assumptions about a particular social group? As a caregiver, do I acknowledge and leverage differences on my patients? Do my words and actions actually reflect my intentions? Do I put myself in the shoes of the other person and empathize with their situation, even if I don't relate to it? And here's another example. So I work at um, Oak Street Health, which is geared towards folks who are Medicare um, uh, aged, even though we do take duly diagnosed. So there's younger, but the bulk of the folks are about 65 and older. So a lot of them do have walkers. A lot of them do have mobility issues. I'm a very fast talker. I'm a very fast walker. And so the one thing that I have done in my role is when I go to meet the clients up at the front desk and walk them back to my office, I'm walking a lot slower and I'm talking a lot slower. Now, am I being biased because of who the population is or am I putting myself in their shoes? And this goes back to, do the words and actions reflect your intentions? Am I trying to belittle them? Am I trying to think of, you know, oh, they need special assistance? Or am I trying to be empathetic? So that's really what should guide you when you're trying to figure this out, if your actions and intentions are pure. So this is what I was talking about. Some people might see this as an offensive gesture. This is Prince William, right? Um, some people might think, oh, you know, princes, what, you know, they think they can do whatever they think they can get away with anything. And some of you might flip people off all the time. And so it's no big deal if you see somebody giving somebody else the finger. But this is the exact same picture from a different angle. Right. So I included this to give you the two perspectives to illustrate how perspective shapes your understandings and your biases. So in the one photo, it might seem like he really is making an offensive gesture, but in the other, he's clearly not. Now, if your thoughts are, oh, those British snobs, you're immediately going to assume he's flipping somebody off. Right. But this is, again, where you would want to kind of check in with your own biases, because as soon as you see the other one, if you kind of take a step back and think, oh, then you know you've got a bias thing going on, right? So this demonstrates that our interpretations are influenced by our viewpoints, our preconceptions, our biases and perspectives. They can lead to misunderstandings. And so we've got to recognize that we all have biases that help us to approach situations with greater awareness and empathy. So we know that microaggressions are. We know that they've gone um, on for over lots of time because as long as people have biases, there's been microaggressions, even though this is a term that was coined in the 70s. We've gone over some examples. We know how they originate with the biases. We know how to be more aware of our biases by asking those questions. Um, so now what do we do with them if we're on the receiving end of them? 
right? Microaggressions are referred to as the paper cuts of discrimination because while seemingly minor, when they accumulate over time, they can lead to significant emotional and psychological stress. Repeated slights can erode an individual's self-esteem, leaving them feel isolated and undervalued. Words hurt. They can inflict injury, as our quote we started off with stated. Also, in context of why we are meeting today, right, it reduces job satisfaction, especially those of us who work with the public, and it often can lead to leaving employment. It leads to impaired performance. Microaggressions can hinder an individual's ability to perform their best. It's affecting their personal success. It also affects the organizational success because if you're not feeling good, whoever the company is that you work for isn't feeling good about your work, right? Stifled creativity. These microaggressions can inhibit your creativity and innovation because now you might be hesitate to share your, your unique perspective, thinking that you're gonna get those eye rolls or thinking that somebody is gonna do some kind of offhanded comment about what you're saying. It also has a health impact. Chronic exposure to microaggressions has been linked to physical health issues, including increased blood pressure, and heart problems. So it's really important that you address these as you feel them. So what can you do? One, you stay calm. If you're hearing a microaggression, and again, person may not even be realizing that they're saying one, the first thing you wanna do, you take a deep breath and you maintain your composure. Reacting with anger can escalate the situation. So best thing you can do is something that we do often in yoga. It's called a seven, seven, seven. You breathe in over seven counts. You hold it for seven counts and you let it out very slowly over seven counts. And you can do this. I just did it while we were talking or while I was talking. You can do it in front of people. People don't know you're doing it. Seven, seven, seven has been scientifically proven to reduce your blood pressure. So it's a good thing to do if you feel yourself escalating in any situation and you pause. Then be direct, politely, confidently express how the comment or the action made you feel. For example, you know, I feel uncomfortable when you said that. Then seek clarification. Microaggressions are often unintentional. Ask for clarification to give the person a chance to explain themselves. It might be a misunderstanding. And an example is the one I used in the very beginning about somebody saying, gee, you don't look your age. Even the, and I would say, you know, that kind of made me feel like you think that 60 is old. And the person would then go, well, 60 is old. Or they would say, oh no, I didn't mean it like that at all. So you're giving the chance, um, the person a chance to kind of clarify where they're coming from. Choose the right moment though. It's really important. Find an appropriate time to address the issue privately with the individual and then express your feelings calmly and honestly. Be sure you're using I statements. Frame your concerns as your personal experience to avoid sounding accusatory. For example, I feel hurt when I heard your comment. You know, if somebody comes up to you and goes, you know, you really hurt my feelings versus you know, my feelings were really hurt when I heard you say it takes the defensiveness out of it. Right. And so you're really letting somebody know where you're coming from. So that's really important. That's important. Any kind of conflict management. Um, encourage dialogue, encourage an open conversation where the person can ask questions and learn from your perspective. This approach can lead to increased awareness and change. You know, like when we talked about the hair, for example, um, or anything that has to do with something maybe of ethnicity, maybe the other person didn't realize that you were seeing it as being discriminatory or possibly racist. So you're educating that person to help them along. And that's good. Um, set clear boundaries, communicate your expectations for respectful behavior to colleagues and patients. Make it known that microaggressions will not be tolerated. I've got a client 
I'll call her Jessica. She works as a CNA. And so she got put with an older woman um, who, after when Jessica was telling me about this woman and her behaviors, to me, it sounded like the beginning of Alzheimer's, beyond dementia. It's a lot of paranoia, some really kind of odd behavior. But Jessica saw it as a personal attack, and she also felt like the person was possibly setting her up to get into trouble. So, you know, we kind of talked through it a little bit. She ended up talking to the woman and saying, you know, if you're going to continue with this, then I'm probably going to ask to be changed to a different client. So I'm just letting you know that. And she also went to her the people that ran the organization of the caregivers and went and told them what was happening and what was going on and um, said, I just, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not feeling really comfortable. I feel like I'm being set up. And so it happened one more time. She went to her bosses again. And so they switched her. So she advocated for herself. So it's really important that if you feel like this is happening, be sure that you set boundaries. Research shows that the language you use has a profound found impact on the thoughts, emotions, behaviors, not only of yourself, but of others as well. Words you use to describe yourself, your experiences, your dreams, they can either limit you or they can empower you. If I said, you know, what do you want to do with your life? Like, what are your goals? Versus what are you going to do when you achieve your goals? that comes off very different. And it hopefully makes you feel more positive about yourself and talking about what it is you want to accomplish, right? It can change mindsets by a simple choice of wording. Every word that we use, every word you hear, it's an anchor. Every word that you hear or use has been heard before and it's tied to an emotional state. And this takes us back to the very first quote about words are magic. And two of the most magical ones are thank you. And I know somebody in the chat put CNA week. Yeah, thanks for making us sit through these things, right? Or I'm, I'm, I'm reading the intention into that. But the truth is, CNAs are so important. And every organization that I have worked in, we have had CNAs. They are a vital part of um, keeping the health going of our clients and our populations. So thank you all. Um, any questions? I, we're at 3.31, so sorry. It took me a minute past what I was going since I had to go back into the slide presentation. But any questions? That's, that's OK. Um, I do have one question over in the question and answer section. I am a CNA in Houston, which has a large behavioral health center in our massive medical center. I'm thinking about finishing my bachelor's degree in behavioral health science with a concentration in aging. Do you think that is a good path to build on my CNA skills? Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Go for it. For a couple reasons, um, the aging population, because we are healthier, we've got um, better health care than ever before, maybe not affordable, but it's still health care. Um, we have better foods. We're just we're living longer. Um, and so because of that, the healthcare field is just blowing up. So any of you who are looking for a population to kind of specialize in, that's one reason why you see the Oak Street Healths and the Gen Cares and some of these other um, companies going nationwide, popping up all over the place because the aging population, <laughs> well, I was 55 several years ago. So, I mean, I keep heading in that direction. Um, we're we're going to need you. Absolutely. So please, in behavioral health, we always need good people in behavioral health. Awesome. Well, we appreciate that, Miss Amy. And thank you so much for doing this presentation for us today. It has been so informative and so eye-opening. I really think we've learned a lot. And so we very much appreciate you. Um, again, it is CNA week. So we're so excited to kick off CNA week with this webinar. But we do have another one coming up on Tuesday, the 18th. It's called Be Your Own Best Supporter and Fan, and it is going to be hosted by our fabulous board chair, Sherry Perry, and our communication specialist, Joanne Caldy. So we will see you all on Tuesday. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.